So, hi everyone. Uh, we have the pleasure to have uh, Juper today with, with us. Uh, he has done his PhD at Universidade de São Paulo in Brazil, then uh, postdoc at both Fermilab and Northwestern, and mm -hmm. now he's currently a postdoc in Durham. So, it's all yours. <laughs> Okay, so thank you very much for the introduction and thank you very much for the invitation to give this talk. So as a disclaimer, if I'm not being clear of, or you don't understand what I'm saying, please just uh, tell me because I just woke up, I don't know, not long ago. So I'm still a bit, you know, I haven't took coffee. So if, if you need to interrupt me, please do it. So uh, what I, I would like to discuss with you is about how this uh, interplay between primordial black hole and leptogenesis occurs. Uh, because I, th I think it's quite interesting to to, under to think that if we have uh, this a population of primordial black holes in the early universe, they could modify what we expect from many particle uh, physics processes, and among those, uh, leptogenesis, if it occurred. Okay. So uh, let me just give you a brief outline. Uh, the first thing is yeah, I will talk uh, briefly about formation and evaporation of primordial black holes and about thermal epidogenesis, then I will just talk about this interplay. And of course, it's interesting to, to think how can we test these scenarios and then a bit something that I am working right now. So uh, I think for this uh, crowd, I don't need to introduce what are primordial black holes, but let me just do it briefly. So we know that astrophysical black holes, but these, I mean, black holes form from a stellar collapse. They need to have a lower mass, about three solar masses. So if we want to have uh, black holes with uh, masses smaller than this value, we would require large densities and densities like those that occur in the early universe. So this is why uh, black holes with masses much smaller than, for instance, around solar mass would be in principle assumed to be of primordial origin. So how do you form black holes? Well, in the early un in the universe, many people have uh, proposed many mechanisms to form primordial black holes. Among those, for instance, you can have bubble collisions if you have some uh, phase transition. If, if we, when these bubbles collide and if some particles cannot enter uh, inside the bubble, they basically get compressed and then you form a black hole. You can also have some pressure reduction, for instance, when you have QCD transition. Uh, there is a bit of pressure reduction, so in principle things can clap and then form black holes. And also you can have the collapse of uh, density fluctuations, like uh, density fluctuations that are expected from inflation. In this case, uh, black holes form when a density uh, perturbation re-enters the Hubble horizon. And of course, this, there's need to be a threshold for this perturbation to form a black hole, because it needs basically to win over the pressure radiation. Uh, so any the, the radiation the, that they have would have. So there is a threshold that they need to to have. But uh, so in principle, you can parameterize the amount of black holes that are uh, produced in this mechanism in any mechanism by the amount of the initial uh, energy density of black holes with respect to the total, and of course of the initial black hole mass that in general is considered. Uh, to be parameterized by the mass contained inside a Hubble horizon. So what I'm going to talk uh, in the uh, in the, the rest of the talk, I'm not going to focus on the formation mechanism. I will assume that uh, there was a, a, some mechanism that uh, formed black holes with this given mass and initial uh, uh, fraction of the total energy. So I will assume also that all black holes were formed with the same mass. But at the end, I will come back to try to, uh, let's say, ease this assumption and see what happens if we instead consider extended uh, mass distributions. OK, so after these black holes formed, in principle, since um, a, they can have basically any mass, uh, the, their spherical radius can be uh, small. And it's interesting to notice that, it is what Hawking noticed, that if the spherical radius is of the same order of the Compton wavelength of some particle, well, quantum effects become important. And as Hawking uh, demonstrated, this leads to the evaporation of black holes because they start to emit a source of particles called Hawking radiation, of course. 
One key aspect of this uh, evaporation is that it, uh, it will emit uh, all the degrees of freedom existing in nature, even those that don't interact with the standard model. And for me, this is very interesting because uh, this tells us that if you have a population of primordial black holes, they could have been sources of, I don't know, dark matter or dark radiation that would be, that can be produced other ways, right? So, in general, Hawking described and obtained that the instantaneous spectrum of the, the radiation that is emitted that is coming from the black hole has a thermal shape. That is basically this one that we have here for a partial black hole. Uh, but uh, and it depends on what is called the black hole temperature. And um, uh, this temperature is related to the black hole mass in an inverse way. Let's say that uh, when you put numbers, a black hole of about 10 to 13 grams has a temperature of our of 1 GeV. So it's interesting to note, I had the opportunity to, to visit um, Westminster Abbey, and now this famous uh, temperature is written in his tomb. He's buried now in Westminster Abbey. So, okay, uh, so there is an important quantity, which basically tells us that the Hawking evaporation is not exactly a thermal a, a black body uh, radiation. There is the cold, so-called uh, gray body factors or absorption cross section. And this tells us about the departure, this departure from being a completely black body. The reason of the appearance of this absorption cross section is that when particles are emitted, basically they will encounter some uh, potential, some gravitational potential that comes from the fact that the space arm around the black hole is basically curved. And this acts like a, a potential. So you can have the possibility of have uh, backscattering to the black hole. So depending on the energies, and of course, depending on the angular momentum of the particles, they can be rescattered to the black hole. So importantly, this will depend on the spin of the particle. And for me, this is actually a very important quantity to be taken into account. And uh, we will include this quantity in the work that we have done. Okay, so since black holes uh, start to emit uh, particles uh, because simply energy conservation, uh, they will start to lose mass because at the end, so, uh, this, the energy that is emitted from the black holes needs to come from somewhere, right? So they start to lose mass over time. And in principle, we can compute what is the amount or how is the rate of loss of mass just by simply for each particle, we just can compute what is the amount of energy that the black hole will lose. We can reparameterize this using the Hawking spectrum that I showed you before in the so-called uh, evaporation function first introduced by uh, McKeown in the 90s. And the idea of this evaporation function is that it tells you that uh, depending on the degrees of freedom that exists, the black hole can evaporate faster or not. For instance, you can have, in this case, what I'm showing is this evaporation function for the case of neutrino, just an same example. And interestingly, this will depend not only in the neutrino mass, but also depends on the neutrino nature. For instance, if you had Dirac or Majorana neutrinos, since Dirac neutrinos have two more degrees of freedom, you see that there is a change here between this, the line corresponding to Majorana neutrinos and Dirac neutrinos. And also, since uh, in order to be emitted a particle, or let's say if the temperature of the black hole is smaller than the mass of the, uh, of, uh, sorry, if the temperature of the black hole is smaller than the mass of the particle, then there is a large Boltzmann suppression of the emission of this particle. So in principle, you see that at some point for neutrinos, the emission is suppressed. And this is, of course, dependent on the actual neutrino masses, but uh, this is a modification in comparison to what we see for massless neutrinos. Okay, so once we have the mass loss rate for black holes, we can estimate the lifetime of a black hole, right? Just by integrating this function. And interestingly, we find if let's assume that you have an initial mass of the solar of, of solar value, one solar mass, we obtain that this uh, lifetime is huge. It's like 57 orders times the age of the universe. So it's a big number. So it, it's basically depending on the cube on the of the mass of the initial mass of the black hole. But okay, you can you maybe wonder, well, are there any constraints then on the these uh, primordial black holes, and of course, yes. And one important ingredient here is that depending on this initial mass, as I was mentioning, they could have evaporated now or not. You can compute basically what is the initial mass of a black hole that is evaporating today. 
And this is the, around 10 to the 15 uh, grams. So this tells us that uh, black holes that have had an initial mass smaller than this value, they would have evaporated by now, or the, if black holes had a mass larger than this value, they still be around and they could be part or be the whole dark matter. In general, this region of the parameter space here is reparameterized instead of considering beta or beta prime, you just, just uh, relate it by some factor here uh, by considering instead the dark matter fraction. So there are constraints here coming from the evaporation or other constraints from the femtolensing or even gravitational waves. But for our purposes, I will focus on the, oh, sorry, forgot to mention something. So uh, yeah, the part here. So if when you look at the black holes that have already evaporated, uh, there can be very strong constraints because if black holes evaporated during BBN or during the, the, the formation of the CMB, they can modify by significantly these uh, quantities that are, are very well are very well measured. So as you can see here, constraints from CMB are very strong and also constraints from BBN. But of course, if black holes evaporated before uh, the BBN, uh, the constraints are much weaker. So in principle, you can have uh, constraints coming from gravitational waves, so, but basically this means the formation of gravitational high frequency gravitational waves that behave like the radiation. But uh, also can you, you can have, for instance, if you assume the existence of um, supersymmetry, you can have uh, this LSP constraint, or even if you assume that the final fate of black holes is not completely evaporated, but given some relic, you have these constraints. But again, these constraints are sort of model dependent. So in what we'll talk uh, afterwards, I will just assume, uh, I will consider basically we'll focus on this region in which the initial mass of the black hole was smaller than about 10 to the nine gram, which is the region which won't affect BBN. Okay, so once these black holes are formed, let's say they form at some point in the early universe, depending on this initial fraction, this parameter beta, they could have uh, led to a non-standard cosmology because even if, for instance, since black holes will behave mostly as matter, they could lead to an initial, uh, sort of an early matter domination before BBN. And as you can see here, it depends on the actual parameters and the initial mass and the degrees of freedom existing in nature. So in principle, for instance, in this case, if you have a black hole of, uh, let's say, um, the same mass, 10 to the same gram, but a initial fraction of 10 to minus 13, they uh, don't lead to a modification of the evolution. They can modify it. But if you have just a larger amount, you then have um, an early matter domination epoch, uh, which ends uh, when black holes evaporate. And in this case, we can observe the, uh, the uh, sorry, uh, we observe that in the, um, the universe is reheated because of the black hole evaporation. Here, the blue lines are corresponding to the case of, let's say, if you have additional degrees of freedom, for instance, a right-handed neutrino, what happens, how this, uh, the amount of these right-handed neutrinos is populated, but okay. So I think it's quite interesting to think what, what happens with particle processes that happen, that occur when black holes uh, are evaporating or depending on when they start evaporating. So in principle, we can classify assuming uh, primordial black hole domination in the early universe, we can uh, try to separate what happens if, for instance, you have dark matter generation or leptogenesis, uh, depending on when uh, uh, this process occurs with respect to black hole evaporation. For instance, if, let's say, freeze out occurs before black holes dominate, what happens is that when, uh, uh, when these black holes evaporate, they will inject a lot of entropy. So you will have basically the, uh, the entropy dilution will be important for the final amount of dark matter that you produce. Because if you only have production of dark matter here, or let's assume that the amount of black hole, the dark matter from black holes is small. In principle, in that case, what the thing that will matter the most is the entropy dilution. Uh, if let's say if the your particle physics process like dark matter or leptogenesis occur in this what is called the region two, what happens is that you not only will have this entropy dilution but also you have that uh, 
the evolution of your universe will be a, a matter dominated background, right? So in principle, you need to take into account this new, uh, let's say, non-standard cosmology. And the third part, what happens is that black holes, the uh, evaporation starts to become important. And if you have a process here, you have the reheating of the universe happening at the same time, happening at the same time. So in principle, you need to take into account Again, matter domination and also the simultaneous entropy injection because particles, the black hole is still reheating the universe at the same. And finally, if your particle processes happens after black hole evaporation, and if your universe is basically a radiation dominated universe, what happens is that uh, black holes uh, won't make any difference. You just have a normal reheat uh, uh, radiation dominated universe. So you can have any process here and we'll act the same as we are used to normally, like uh, freezing or freeze out. So why is interesting uh, particle production via evaporation? I find it interesting because uh, the physics that affects uh, the particle production is totally different, right? On one hand, let's co compare with the thermal usual a thermal particle decoupling, which is basically, let's consider freezing or freeze out mechanism. And in principle, here uh, we know that the freezing or freeze out mechanism um, will depend on the masses and interactions, because depending on if the interaction is stronger or weaker, the freeze out will happen later or earlier in the, in the universe, right? So it depends not only it depends on the conditions of the universe, of course, but it also depends on the masses and interactions of the particles. On the other hand, Hawking evaporation doesn't care about the details of the interactions of the particles. It cares about the mass of the, as the existence first of these particles, and then about the mass of the particles. Because as I was mentioning before, if the mass of the particle is smaller than the temperature of the black hole, the mass, then this particle is emitted throughout the history of the universe. Here, this, uh, um, this blue dashed line. But if the uh, black hole initial temperature is smaller than the mass of the particle, since the black hole heat up when they start evaporating, uh, at some point uh, they will uh, start emitting these particles because the temperature becomes uh, big enough to make to produce this particle. So the emission of this particle occurs in the final stages of the black hole evaporation. And also in this case, so the abundance of the, the particles that is emitted, it will depend on first, if you have a modification in your cosmology, this particle production that it depends on the mass of the particle. And also since black holes would emit a lot of radiation from let's say whole gauge bosons, standard model particles, the entropy dilution that it produces, it's, it will be a crucial uh, ingredient for taking into account when you include this uh, Hawking radiation process. So uh, it's interesting to notice that there could be an interplay between these two uh, mechanisms, as I was talking before. You can have, uh, for instance, the production of dark matter before the evaporation or after or at the same time. So this interplay, I, I also find quite interesting. So uh, there are many possibilities that you can consider by producing particles from evaporation. For instance, you can have producing purely gravitationally interacting dark matter that's totally disconnected from the standard model. Uh, so in principle, you can have some sort of uh, dark matter production and have dark matter besides primordial black hole dark matter. You can also modify freezing and freeze out mechanisms. And this is something we have many people have work, including us. Uh, also, uh, you can have the production of hot gravitons. Uh, that could be uh, even testable in future experiments of delta and effect, for instance. And this is basically production of dark radiation. And this is also something we have considered in the past. But for the purpose uh, today, I will talk about what is the effect of having a primordial black hole evaporation with uh, you have uh, with the production of the baryon asymmetry. There as well, there have many other people that have worked on this. Uh, so um, we were uh, gonna focus on the case of uh, some works we have done re uh, related to leptogenesis. Okay, so let me just remind you briefly about thermal leptogenesis. So from observation, we know that I, our universe has a baryon asymmetry of this amount. And Sakharov uh, demonstrated that you need at least these three conditions to have the production of uh, baryon asymmetry from uh, starting from a, let's say, a universe without this asymmetry. 
So basically you require barium and lepton number violation, CP violation, and departure from thermal equilibrium. Interestingly, on the other hand, when we discovered that neutrinos were massive, and when uh, even though the CISO mechanism was uh, proposed before that, uh, people noticed that there could be an interesting connection between the generation of neutrino masses and the production of this barium asymmetry in the what is called the type one CISO. Because in this case, if you have additional right-handed neutrinos that are very heavy, First, you are able to explain the smallest of neutrino masses because you have uh, the suppression of the electric weak scale. Uh, sorry, you have the suppression of the neutrino masses with respect to the electric weak scale because of the presence of these right handed neutrino masses. And on the other hand, since in this case, these, these neutrinos will imply that neutrinos are Majorana, you will be violating lepton number. Besides, the Yukawa parameters that enter in the new uh, Yukawa couplings, uh, they can have a large amount of CP violation. So in principle, you can have uh, you are fulfilling these two conditions. And finally, you can depart from the equilibrium because if depending on the masses of these right-handed neutrinos, they could have been populated in the early universe. But when the universe started to, to expand, the amount of uh, these right-handed neutrinos that are they, they were uh, probably in equilibrium, they cannot be in disequilibrium any, any longer, and they decay out of equilibrium, producing find the final condition that we require to fulfill the Sakharov conditions. So in order to describe this in principle, uh, I, don't, I don't want to enter in detail, but we will use a set of Boltzmann equations that basically describe the production of these right-handed neutrinos from the plasma in thermal leptogenesis specifically, and then how this decay, the decay of these right-handed neutrinos produce a B minus cell asymmetry that will be transformed to a baryon asymmetry via Sfaderon processes. So how does it work in, in general? So first, uh, we can assume that uh, for, for some given values of the masses of the right-handed neutrinos, so at the temperature of when the universe reaches a temperature of the same order, let's say, of the right-handed neutrino mass or larger, the right-handed neutrinos can be created via inverse processes, even if you have an initial abundance zero uh, because of this inverse process. At some point, this uh, equilibrium, uh, this abundance, sorry, it wasn't the equilibrium abundance, this abundance reaches the equilibrium. And uh, because of the decay of these, uh, the different decay of these right-handed neutrinos in the leptons and eighteen leptons, you create a lepton asymmetry. And then uh, after that, when uh, these decays, right, uh, they will uh, transform this lepton asymmetry into a baryon asymmetry via Sphaleron processes, as I was mentioning before. So this is more or less the scheme, the general idea of how thermal leptogenesis works. So uh, one interesting thing is that when we start to look at, uh, well, some people start to look at what are the parameters in which leptogenesis works, and notice that even if you consider, let's say, if you start to consider very heavy right-handed neutrinos, let's say masses of 10 to the 12 GV, other processes can be coming. For instance, you can have uh, processes in which you have uh, the, the change on the, the lepton number in two units, like let's say this part, of this diagram, and this process can become very important because uh, this process can lead to a washout of the asymmetry that is produced from the decay of the right-handed neutrinos. So I think it's quite important to take into account uh, these processes uh, because, for instance, in this case, what we find is that uh, well, what people found is that if these uh, delta L equal two equilibriums are in equilibrium, they basically will uh, erase the asymmetry that is produced. So this happens when the temperature is, let's say, the larger than the mass of the right-handed neutrino, and also depends on the Yukawa couplings. Uh, so in principle, when we have that the right-handed neutrino mass, let's assume that uh, the temperature is sort of the same order of the right-handed neutrino masses. So if the right-handed neutrino masses are larger than this value here, in principle, you find that this, uh, uh, you have a strong washout coming from this delta L equal to processes. So in principle, if even though uh, these masses of the right-handed neutrinos would be, let's say, interesting because they could be related to a, a gut scale breaking, or yeah, they could uh, explain uh, why the neutrinos are as uh, light if, when you have a gut scale model, 
uh, in principle, this kind of process can erase a lot of your asymmetry. And then you have this issue. So in principle, uh, one may wonder, well, is there a way to save this high scale leptogenesis? One way to do this is try to produce right-handed neutrinos, not with thermal processes, so not with thermal leptogenesis that I was talking before, but try to produce right-handed neutrinos with uh, other mechanisms. So, uh, and when, uh, it would be interesting to produce these right-handed neutrinos way after this washout process here, the delta equal, delta L equal to processes have wash, uh, have frozen. So, of course, you already know the answer, it's a spoiler. So one possibility that we have considered is to have primordial black holes as sources of these right-handed neutrinos after these processes have frozen. But okay, before going to the details of our work, I would like to do a bit of a shameless self-propaganda. I would like just to advertise our code that is called Ulysses, which is basically a universal leptogenesis equation solver, which basically we wanted to, we created a Python code in which basically it's able to compute lepton asymmetry for different models. So, and includes basically many ingredients, includes uh, spectator effects, loop effects, the washout process I was talking before, and also flavor effects, depending on the scale of the right-handed neutrons. So, uh, sorry, if I, yeah. So uh, right now our code, the first version only included leptogenesis via decays, this thermal leptogenesis I was talking before, and also resonant leptogenesis. And recently we have put a new version in which basically is also included the uh, leptogenesis created by the oscillation of the right-handed neutrons. So our idea is that we wanted to have this code to be fast and would be easy to parallelize and it would be able to make a, a multidimensional scan of the parameter space using, for instance, in our case, multinest. So in this case, I just want to say, if you are interested in to, to work on this, we are we, we can help you if, uh, I don't know, if you have any problem, just let us know. And also the idea is that also people can introduce their models to um, the package, the whole Ulysses package. But okay, that was the whole propaganda. Uh, we now we may wonder, well, what's the effect of the primordial black holes? Can they actually try to destroy the asymmetry like these harpies here? Or will they help actually the, the production of the barium asymmetry? So interplay the, between the primordial uh, between primordial black hole evaporation and leptogenesis. So this is, will be based in these two works. So uh, let's forget for just a second the thermal leptogenesis and let's assume that black holes are emitting uh, are producing the whole barium asymmetry. Uh, this can be happen as these people have pointed out in many these works and other and others. So in this case, we can assume that there exists some addition additional X particle which decays uh, violating B minus L. And we can just basically compute what is the total number of these particles just by integrating the Hawking rate, right? So if we integrate the Hawking rate, it will tell us the total number of particles that are produced. So from this, we just can compute what is the yield, what is the amount, let's say, of this like sort of the number density of the particles that are produced. And of course, there is an important ingredient that I have already talked before. We need to take into account the entropy dilution because again, black holes with emit a lot of radiation and this can change. This will basically reheat the universe. And this is actually very important to take into account. And after that, we just can compute. And you don't, please don't care about much of the details of this equation. What is really important is that the final amount of this particle that is produced, it will crucially depend on whether the, uh, the particles can be emitted throughout the lifetime of the, the black hole or only in the final stages, as I was talking before. It depends if, uh, what, if the initial mass of this, sorry, the initial temperature of, of the black hole is larger or is smaller than the mass of this particle X. So after that, we just can basically can compute what is the maximum amount of uh, baryonic jet that can be produced considering this phaleron uh, transformation. So the, the, considering that these phalerons will transform this P minus cell asymmetry into baryon asymmetry. So of course, it depends on the amount of CP violation that the decays of these particles have. 
And basically what we can do here is that uh, for different masses of this uh, X particle, we can vary the, CP, the amount of CP violation necessary to produce the, uh, the observed baryon asymmetry. So here we, uh, we are just showing for six different masses. And for instance, you can notice that for some values we would require for some parameters of black holes. Sorry, I forgot to mention this is like the amount of black holes, beta, the initial fraction as function of the initial black hole mass. So for some parameters here, you would require too much baryon acid, too much CP violation in order to create, produce the the observed uh, baryon symmetry. Sorry. <clears throat> so, as you can see here, if you have heavier uh, particles, the you would require large uh, this parameter space in which you have uh, require a large amount of um, CP violation. It's large and decreases. And the reason is that depending uh, in this, at some point, uh, the uh, these black holes, let's say around 10 to the 3 or 10 to the 4 grams, they are too cold to produce the enough uh, baryon, the enough number of particles X necessary to produce baryogenesis. But if they become colder, sorry, sorry, if the mass become smaller, these black holes start can produce them throughout the whole lifetime of this, uh, of the black holes. An interesting thing is that, well, if we consider the specific case of right-handed neutrinos, we know there is this the so-called Davidson Ibarra bound. And it, it, the things, one interesting thing we notice is that at some point the Davidson Ibarra bound is no longer fulfilled. So in principle, you would require some tuning in order to have the amount of CP violation for uh, masses smaller than 10 to the 12 GB. But of course, Something that I, I think it's quite important is that since we are requiring the these particles to decay into standard model particles because we are going to produce a baryon asymmetry, but thermal processes cannot be simply ignored. They need to be taken into account, or there should be some justification of why we want to introduce thermal processes. So this is why, in principle, we need to. Uh, in my opinion, we need to take these two things into account at the same time to be completely consistent. So for the now coming back to the specific case of leptogenesis, the part of thermal leptogenesis we, uh, that we have will be act in the same way because at, at the end, these two processes are independent, but sort of independent. Uh, but then we will have like the, the, the part of black holes. So black holes will, oh, sorry. Black holes would form at some point, and they could lead to a non-standard cosmology. And during the between formation and evaporation, the right-handed neutrinos will be emitted, and the decays of these right-handed neutrinos will also produce a lepton asymmetry, also related uh, independently from this lepton asymmetry that is produced from the the from the thermal part from the thermal. Part. And again, one thing that is interesting to notice is like. When uh, these two things happen with respect to the other, can lead to significant modifications of the final baryon asymmetry that is produced. As I was talking before, it depends if it happens before black holes dominate the, the evolution of the universe, if the or it happens when black holes have disappeared. Or not. Like remember, coming back to this figure I talked in the beginning. Okay, so in principle, uh, we can just have some set of Boltzmann equations that describe both uh, leptogenesis produced from the thermal plasma and from black hole evaporation. Here, let, let me take a ex similar example I was talking before, a black hole mass of 10 to uh, 7 grams and initial fraction of 10 to the minus 3. Uh, just recalling that beta prime is related to beta just by a factor. And in principle, we can compare what happens when you have only thermal leptogenesis here in dashed lines. And then with the comparison, uh, when you include uh, this type of black hole evaporating producing right-handed neutrinos and assuming some given a uh, right-handed neutrino mass here. So we see that the change, you have a significant change of the spectrum. Oh, sorry, on the uh, uh, abundance of these right-handed neutrinos here. So let me just go into more details to explain why we have this shape specifically. 
And there will be basically three scenarios. And these three scenarios will re be related to when uh, the black hole evaporations happen with respect to thermal epidemics. So first, you can have that the black holes evaporate before uh, right-handed neutrinos are thermally produced. So it is like during this region, uh, like in, during basically in the region four, right? So in this case, what we expect is that since you had a, a non, a, basically you are again having a radiation dominated universe after black hole evaporation, and then leptogenesis happens at the end, there is no much of effect that we can expect from the evaporation of black holes. So something more interesting happens when the evaporation occurs during thermal leptogenesis or after uh, thermal leptogenesis. So let me just consider what happens uh, again for these scenarios, for the scenarios B and C, because I think they are more interesting. So uh, here I'm just showing the right-handed neutrino abundance and the fire baryon asymmetry for some parameters. And again, this is like this, let's say, dark yellow lines correspond to the case of having only thermal epidogenesis. Oh, sorry. So we can separate what is the contribution of the right-handed neutrino abundance coming from only from the black hole evaporation. And this is what we see. Basically, the right-handed neutrino population is slowly uh, created. And at some point, you see a big uh, uh, sharp rise that happens when uh, black holes enter the final stage which is basically since the, the black hole evaporation starts to accelerate at the end of the lifetime of the black hole, you have this explosive stage, which produces a large amount of particles. And in this case, so these right-handed neutrinos are produced, and basically the universe is uh, too cold for them to uh, thermalize, so basically they decay immediately. And this is the uh, amount of asymmetry that is produced just by the black hole that by the right-handed neutrinos that are produced from black hole evaporation. So we, we have the two contributions. This is why we see that this uh, basically, you have the sort of like the sum of these two contributions because um, uh, at the end you will have a, a bit of modification because thermal leptogenesis can also happen in a non uh, standard cosmology when black holes dominate. So this is what you can have some modification in the chain. But at the end, the idea is that these two things can occur at the same time. And the final baryon asymmetry, as you can see here, is started close to what we expect from the case of uh, thermal epidogenesis. But then it will be in this specific scenario that I'm showing, you have a diminution of the asymmetry compared to the case of thermal epidogenesis. And the reason is that, as I was mentioning before, entropy dilution coming from the black hole evaporation is quite important for these parameters. So maybe what happens, uh, so this, sorry, I forgot to mention, this is more or less when uh, the case B, when black holes evaporate during leptogenesis or close to the end of thermal leptogenesis. But what happens if the black holes evaporate much after uh, thermal leptogenesis? So in this case, let's say that uh, Z of black hole, which is basically the mass of the right-handed neutrino over the temperature of the black hole is close to one. In this case, again, you have to do thermal leptogenesis in standard way, but then you have the production of the right-handed neutrinos from the black hole. But in this case, as you can see here, it becomes constant at some point. And the reason is that we found that uh, black holes emit the same amount that of right-handed neutrinos that they're decaying. So at the end, these two effects of the uh, right-handed neutrinos coming from evaporation and their decay makes that this right-handed neutrino bounds becomes almost constant. It's not exactly constant, but in this scale, looks uh, all it's, it looks constant, but it's not exactly constant. And again, we have the production of this baryon asymmetry just from the black hole. And again, we find that in this case, close to the complete baryon asymmetry, the right-handed neutrino abundance is close to the sum. And again, we see that there is a diminishing here of coming from this, oh, sorry, coming from this, um, the evaporation of black holes at the end. So main thing interesting is that these black holes here are emitting right-handed neutrinos when the bash out processes that I was talking before, are half frozen out. So in principle, this uh, you should be expected to create a lot of right-handed neutrinos here, and that decay would produce, a, a, let's say, a large amount of baryon asymmetry. But because of the entropy dilution, you this is a larger effect than com in comparison to the amount of right-handed neutrinos that is produced. And then if we have uh, black holes that are much, much later, 
what happens is that in this case, if the temperature, the initial temperature of the black hole is too small in comparison with the right handed neutrino mass, the emission of these uh, right handed neutrinos only occurs by the end of the lifetime of the black hole. And even in this case, uh, here I'm not even showing them because it's like the product, the, there is a right handed neutrino abundance coming from the black hole evaporation, which only occurs in the final stages of the explosion of the black holes. But in this case, not even seen. So it's, it's, very, it's very reduced. So in this case, if the black holes evaporate too late and they, if they were too cold initially, the only effect is that black holes basically are injecting a lot of entropy in the universe and they are basically only erasing the asymmetry coming from uh, the thermal uh, leptogenesis part. So when would this happen? So let me just take an example. Uh, just let's uh, see when this two things can occur. So in principle, let me fix the right-handed neutrino mass to be this value. And in order to, to make like, uh, to see what would be the largest effect, we can basically fine tune our Jokawa so, so that uh, thermal leptogenesis produce the largest amount of uh, asymmetry possible. And then we can just basically fix the amount of uh, black holes that you have in the, the initial uh, amount of black holes you have in the universe and their body the mass. So again, we see the different uh, um, the different uh, say, regions that I was talking before. For instance, uh, this dashed line, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that this dashed line correspond to the final baryon asymmetry without any black hole. So if the black hole had a, a mass much smaller than, um, let's say, around one gram, in this case, what happens is that um, uh, they operate before thermal leptogenesis era. So in that case, um, we see that there is no modification of as we were expecting. But then what happens if, if you start to uh, have the evaporation during thermal leptogenesis era or after, you see that you can have a strong reduction of many orders of magnitude in comparison to the K, to the value of this uh, baryon asymmetry, the uh, baryon to photon ratio uh, without black holes. And this is become uh, this is coming basically from the fact that you are injecting a lot of entropy in this case. So again. Uh, as I was mentioning, is uh, this? Of course, I was fixing the amount of black holes that that you have, and of course, if you have less black holes, you would expect that the entropy dilution is much less significant. But uh, we so this is what we did, like these uh, planes in which we are varying basically the initial amount of black holes as function of the initial black hole mass, and these lines uh, tell this blue black uh, sorry this white line tell us if you can have a modification of your cosmology or in other words, you can have some primordial black hole domination. So as you can see here, at some point, uh, this, for instance, if we take a black hole, right-handed neutrino mass of around 10 to 8 GeV, what happens is that there is a mass that before that black holes don't make any difference. And the reason is, as I was talking before, leptogenesis happens after black hole evaporation. But after that, we see in this case, that we only are seeing a modification and a reduction of the baryon asymmetry, but some orders of magnitude. This happens in both these cases, 10 to 11 GeV and 10 to the 8 uh, GeV. So we are stopping, actually, I forgot to mention before that uh, we are not considering a, a black holes with have uh, larger masses than 10 to 5 grams because um, uh, this this occur uh, the evaporation of this black hole would occur after the sphaleron freeze out, so in principle there wouldn't be possible to translate the lepton asymmetry to baryon asymmetry. But into some people have uh, uh, pointed out that in principle you can have sphalerons active around the black hole, and this is something that we are currently considering to to understand what happens if you have sphalerons active around black holes and if you have some modification of the body uh, the uh, asymmetry even in these cases that I'm showing here but this is some, something we're still working on okay so but okay so probably you would say well this seems a bit too negative because at the end I was talking only about entropy dilution and it seems that only black holes are like erasing the asymmetry so it's like another an additional washout that's coming from these black holes so yeah, that's true. But it, what we notice is that it's only occurring when the right-handed neutrino masses are small, like smaller than 10 to the 11 G. 
When you start to go to the region of high scale optogenesis that I was talking before, masses, let's say, larger than 10 to the 12th uh, GV, the effect is the opposite, actually. So uh, in that case, what happens is that thermal optogenesis is not able to produce the enough amount of uh, baryon asymmetry. And in that case, uh, the, you can have the production of the baryon asymmetry only coming from black. So here, what we did, and of course, sorry, I forgot to mention that the delta L equal two processes are actually very dependent on the, uh, uh, let's say, on the scale of the heaviest neutrino, active neutrino masses. So uh, this is the same plot. So this, um, let's say, this dot dot dash line corresponds to the region that will be uh, effective. Uh, so so this line uh, here is. The parameters if for some given values of the Yukawa parameters that are maximized over. So this line here gives you the observed baryon asymmetry. And as you can see here, for instance, if let's say Katrin sees some uh, neutrinos that are, I don't know, heavier than 0.2 electron volts, the heaviest neutrino mass, uh, and then you have problems with high uh, scale leptogenesis, because in this case, it would be very difficult to produce the enough baryon asymmetry for gut scale right-handed neutrinos. And this, the reason is that uh, this is related to this delta L equal to washout processes, of course. But what we saw is that when you start to include a black hole population, in that case, as I was talking before, if the black hole uh, population evaporates after this delta L equal to process half washing out, in that case, they can produce the uh, uh, right amount of baryon asymmetry that we observe. And of course, this depends on the black hole uh, initial mass. So this uh, red line corresponds to the parameter space, let's say that the color regions are uh, giving us a baryon uh, asymmetry of uh, bary uh, baryonic yield larger than the observed one. So in this case, you see that a uh, thermal leptogenesis could happen for a larger amount of, or a larger um, parameter space in comparison with only thermal leptogenesis. This is a bit reduced when you have um, a large, heavier black holes, because in that case, uh, again, you can have this, this region here is cut because again, uh, the temperature, the initial temperature of the black hole is smaller than the mass of these right-handed neutrinos. So in the, that's, that case, they, they only produce these right-handed neutrinos at the end of their lifetimes. So this can be more clearly seen in these panels, where we basically took three bench point, uh, benchmark points here. So in first, let's say, consider point A, when you have, uh, uh, let's say, heavier uh, active neutrinos that could be seen by Catherine and rather heavy right-handed neutrinos 10 to the 15 GeV. So in this case, uh, this actually, there is another line here that corresponds to thermal leptogenesis, but uh, it's not seen. But basically they follow this pattern and then goes, uh, basically goes to zero. But in this case, when you have a, a black hole of 0.1 gram, then you have the pro production of these right-handed neutrinos at some point, which stabilizes. If, in this case, uh, you see that uh, you also have the uh, right-handed neutrinos or the baryonic yield that is coming from the black hole evaporation of uh, black hole initial mass of one gram. But in this case, you see that there is only a, a sharp rise of the amount of the baryonic, uh, baryonic yield at the end. And this is because these black holes are only producing right-handed neutrinos right at the end of their life. So you can see the ease of this effect when you have, let's say, lighter right-handed neutrinos, like in this case. And in this case, this is why uh, we see that the point B, in this case, um, uh, you are producing right-handed neutrinos throughout the lifetime, and then you have the final amount produced when the black hole basically disappears. But in this case, both uh, 0.1 and 1 gram work for, uh, for this case of right-handed neutrinos. And finally, if the uh, mass of the right-handed neutrino is too small, what happens is that black holes evaporate for this case of 0.1 gram, evaporate too early. So in that case, when they evaporate, this delta L equal to washout process are still active. And they, even though you see that there is a tiny peak here that corresponds when the black holes evaporate, the um, washout processes still are active and they erase the asymmetry produced from black holes. <laughs> 
this doesn't happen for this case of 0.1 of, of one gram because at the end uh, this they evaporate much later and then this washout process have frozen out. So uh, we can wonder what happens what if we have heavier black holes and again oh this is what I want to say oh sorry. Uh, so what happens with heavier black holes is that um, uh, entropy dilution again starts to play an important role and then it starts to reduce the parameter space that you have. So now instead we can consider another plane, another direction, this parameter space, which now we can fix what are the initial uh, right-handed neutrino masses and uh, uh, the heaviest neutrino mass and vary what is the initial amount of black holes and the uh, initial black hole mass. So in this case, uh, we see that here, uh, this is like the comparison of the baryonic yield to the observed value. And we see here that for some specific parameters, uh, you can reproduce the observed va value. And this basically related to the same figures that I was talking before that they show the decay of the particle X. But this is, a, let's say, a more consistent way to treat this because we are including all the thermal processes uh, that occur in the, in the plasma. So even here, we can have an enhancement of 10, six of orders of magnitude comparison in comparison to the observed variant in here uh, for these specific parameters. Uh, but now we can basically change uh, what are the um, uh, uh, the right-handed neutrino masses for different values, 10 to the 13, 10 to the 14, and 15. And we see that there are basically two cuts in this region of the uh, for the regions that work. So this line and inside these lines basically correspond to the values that would produce the observed variance. So on one hand, uh, you see here that is what I'm calling efficient production. And this is the, the reason is that, again, uh, these black holes are too cold to produce these right-handed neutrinos throughout their lifetime. So there is not an efficient production of these right-handed neutrinos. And on the other hand, this is uh, this line is cut because washout processes are still active during evaporation. This is what you have to cut. And below here, of course, it's that uh, this cut that we have, this shape here, uh, it comes from the fact that if you don't have enough amount of black holes, they won't produce the uh, observe the uh, observe uh, variant asymmetry. If you have too few black holes, the amount of right-handed neutrinos is not enough to produce the asymmetry we observe. So how do we test these scenarios? Of course, because I was talking everything about in the early universe, and although interesting, I think it it would be interesting to find a way to prove that these primordial black holes existed, and if there was a primordial black hole dominated there. One possibility is try to look for gravitational waves that are produced or gravitons produced from the evaporation. Uh, but when what when we compute what is the frequency of these gravitational waves. Um, sorry, I forgot to add some uh, reference that it was computed this uh, a while ago. We find that the, the frequency of these gravitational waves is huge. It's like 10 to the 14 hertz, much, much farther than what we can expect from future experiments. But even though there are some proposals to look for graviton photon conversion and try to look for this huge frequency. So it, it's not completely, uh, let's say, uh, unexpected. It is not completely crazy to try to look for these gravitational waves coming from the evaporation. Other possibility is what is called the poltergeist me mechanism uh, that what has been uh, proposed by these people here. And the idea is that the, uh, there is a, since when black holes evaporate, there is a sudden transition between a matter dominated universe to a radiation dominated universe. So in principle, when you have this sudden transition, you can produce gravitational waves because uh, your gravitational potential uh, will have some specific shape uh, because of this transition. So uh, and this, pro this uh, people have computed what is the spectrum of gravitational waves uh, depending on the initial black hole mass. And as you can see here, they, uh, they are, uh, they show that they can test very light black holes from 10 to the 2 to 10 to the 8 grams. And they lie in the region that, in principle, you can expect this uh, future gravitational wave detector. So, in principle, it's important, it's, it would be interesting to see if these gravitational waves are fine because of this uh, poltergeist mechanism. And it's important because, in principle, if you are able to test uh, 
this, for instance, CENTO L4 gram, it will tell you that even if right handed neutrino, if, if leptogenesis occur, if the right handed neutrino mass is too low, let's say as the example I was showing of 10 to the 8 GeV, the, the largest effect it would be entropy dilution. And this would mean that uh, these, let's say, intermediate scale leptogenesis, which the right handed neutrino is like 10 to the 8 GeV, it would be in some trouble because we know that the amount of the entropy that these black holes would uh, produce is too large to yeah, that it erases the, the baryon asymmetry, even in the case in which you are tuning your Yokawa parameters. So I think this is quite interesting complementarity between looking for these gravitational waves and uh, intermediate scale up analysis. So this is what uh, they proposed. So this is what they, sorry, as a result, what happens, what are the region of the parameter space that you can test? And it's the same beta as function of the initial uh, black hole mass. And of course, depends on the experiment, in this case, uh, this the silico LISA. And one interesting thing that we'll come back next is that it, this poltergeist me mechanism really depends on the sharp transition between matter to radiation dominated universe. So let's say if instead of having a monochromatic mass distribution, you had a, a Gaussian distribution, which is not very peaked, the effect of this sudden transition is less significant. So the amount of, of gravitational waves that are produced is smaller and can be seen here between these let's say, uh, thicker lines in comparison to this dash, uh, let's say less thick lines here for these parameters of the um, black hole mass. So in principle, as you can see here, they could be testing uh, uh, these black holes in this parameter space, which is the same parameter space that could falsify intermediate scale leptogenics. So in progress, I have a few time. So uh, let me just talk briefly about uh, try to remove this last assumption I was talking before, like not considering uh, monochromatic distributions, but considering instead extended distributions. So we have been able to basically produce some uh, some code that considers the evaporation of uh, these uh, mass uh, distributions and mass and spin distributions. And what I'm showing here is just, oh, sorry, uh, an animation that uh, tells you what is, the, for instance, if you have some sort of initial log normal distribution with shape, how it will evolve on time. And this evolution on time is basically, it's coming from the fact that black holes are evaporating. So the lighter black holes evaporate faster, and this is why you have this tiny change on the shape, but at the end, all black holes evaporate at some. Also something that we did is like considering mass and spin, so care black holes uh, distribution. So in this case, what I will show you is like the, uh, how does this, let's, uh, an initial density, an initial population of black holes, how they will basically evolve from time and disappear at some point. This uh, shaded region here correspond to non-physical parameters. So uh, for this time, after they, they are formed, you cannot have any black hole with two, 10 to the two grams and this, lar this large spin parameter, because it would imply that when they formed, they had uh, a, a spin larger than what is expected. So let me just show you again this. So it, you see that there is a change on the shape because of the black hole evaporation. And this is basically because these black holes are evaporating first than the black holes afterwards. So of course, as I was mentioning, if you have these mass and spin distributions, what happens is that you will change how the transition between a matter and a radiation dominated universe occurs. And this is just an example for the same lo uh, log normal distribution. So if you have very peaked uh, uh, um, uh, log normal, this transition is quite fast. But then if it's not as peaked, but it's very wide, uh, then uh, the transition is much slow. Where here is basically the number of e-folds between the, the initial, between the formation of black holes and after the evaporation. But okay, so what happens with uh, leptogenesis? In this case, what happens is that in principle, you can have black holes uh, that are lighter and they are efficient in producing right-handed neutrinos and then have heavier black holes that uh, basically will inject a lot of entropy and they will try to compensate the production of, of baryons. So here I'm just showing for some parameters, some specific parameters, the... Um, uh, the case for a monochromatic mass distribution and a log normal for with two widths. 
So first is the same shape as we saw before. This is for a specific case. Uh, sorry, I forgot to put the value of the error hand in the three months, but it's about 10 to the 14 GeV, which is what uh, the highly scale leptogenicity requires. So you see that the same shape at the end, you have this sharp rise when the all black holes evaporate at the same time. And it's the final stages. But then if you start to have um, wider distribution happens, this effect that I was talking about, you have first the uh, production of the right hand the neutrinos, and then uh, the same population, which is composed for the heavier black holes, uh, dilute a bit at the end, because you have the production, and then you have a bit of dilution coming from the entropy dilution. And then if it's too wide, they basically, if you have too much uh, heavy right hand, uh, heavy black holes, they will inject a lot of it. So it's interesting to note that having primordial black holes with different masses could have different impact on the results that I showed you before. And this is something that we are working on. So to conclude, um, primordial black hole evaporation affair offers a unique mechanism to produce particles. And I think it's quite interesting because I was talking in the beginning, it's a totally different mechanism to the one we are used to. It's basically, it's not, let's say, a standard particle interactions, but it's coming from Hawking radiation, from the Hawking effect. And there can be some interesting interplay between thermal produced particles or and these Hawking evaporation. And you can have basically summarized this, there are basically three effects. You have an universal particle production because you can produce particles that don't interact with the standard model. Then you can produce, you modify your cosmological background, and then you can have a large entropy dilution that modifies your final results. So in this case, I just show you what happens on leptogenesis, assuming the existence of a primordial black hole population. And some future direction is like, uh, as I was talking, it's interesting to try to relate to more realistic formation mechanism. And the first step is to consider not monochromatic mass distribution, but extent. And this is something that we are working on. Other thing is like, I was talking a very high scale leptogenesis, but maybe it's also interesting to look to uh, low scale leptogenesis, which could be tested in colliders and try to understand what is the effect of sphalerons if they are active around primordial black hole after the lecto-weak phase transition. Also, maybe uh, there might be other effects that happens with curved black holes, and this is something we are exploring. So with this, I conclude. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joubert. That was a great talk. Uh, are there any questions? Um, okay, can I ask one question? Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. Um, so so can, can you briefly comment on how you would form those black holes at a very early universe? Because that's now, you're looking at very high scales, right? So well, what would be mechanisms which form those? Uh, so, yeah, so this is why it's something I'm working right now, like considering some specific uh, setup for uh, inflation, right? So no like standard uh, one field inflation, but having multi field inf inflation, and this is something we are working on. But this is it's still not let's say very clear to how to produce uh, to, to form this black hole. So this I still don't have any definite answer for that. But we are all, like trying to connect, as I was mentioning, this black uh, the formation mechanism for some like black holes like those. Mm -hmm. So you want to connect it with inflation. Okay, so that, yes, that would have yes, been my other instance, question. Or... Okay. How does it fit in with inflation? But that's, uh, maybe, yes. Yeah, so this is like a first step, like trying to see if you can have some specific setup for inflation or we are looking at our mechanism formation. So as, as I was talking in the beginning, uh, we are a bit agnostic right now. How is the formation mechanism? Mm -hmm. But we are trying to now explore how connect to formation mechanism more specific. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Are there more questions? Maybe we can ask another one. <laughs> so as you mentioned yeah, the testability of those primordial black holes, um, but the gravitational wave signal that was basically only in the mass range of 10 to the 4 gram or so, but, but yeah. the effects which you discussed were mostly much lighter with kind yes. of order gram 
Is there any way to get down to that or to test those with the? Well, that's so actually, yeah, you're right. So in principle, if you have lighter black holes, the production of these induced gravitational waves will like, uh, let's say, to higher higher frequencies, right? It's yeah. like if you move here, let's say, ten to the ten gram. So in principle, it it it, it depends on the technology to detect uh, high fr higher frequency uh, gravitational waves. So in principle, the mechanism should work the same, this polter guys, but in principle would lie in a region where you have, sorry, let me get more this, uh, hey, like, I don't know, 10 to the six or 10 to the eight uh, Hertz uh, gravitational waves and try to look for technology that looks for this. But in principle, uh, I'm not an expert on that. So in principle, I don't know yeah. if there exists like a look, uh, search for these gravitational waves in this region, but in principle, uh, these gravitational waves uh, coming from these mechanisms should be there, but uh, I think it's a technological question of experimental question to see if it uh, will be able to test this higher frequency. Mm -hmm. Probably there is, um, yeah. Yeah, I think it would be interesting in general to test those yeah. very high frequency gravitational yeah, waves yeah, yeah. for early universe physics. Uh, yeah, also exactly. You, yeah. Uh, particle production of, uh, yeah, just in general particle production in the early universe. Yeah, so the, there is the, the gap because of you. Uh, sorry, uh, of course, looking for direct graviton emission from black holes is rather difficult, even though there are some proposals. But these are very huge frequencies, right? And uh, I don't know how the aspect of having a coherent wave is actually true for these high frequencies. So you start to consider like the particle uh, nature of these gravitational waves. So uh, if that's why looking for this direct. Uh, Gravitational waves from black hole evaporation can be a bit uh, uh, still not clear, but it, it's probably more more clear to look for these gravitational waves uh, when you have this mechanism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, but that was great. Okay.